Okay, hi everybody. Um, uh, I'm back with you. Uh, for those who uh, uh, didn't meet me uh, a couple hours ago, I'm Shane Stansbury. I, I teach here at Duke, and it is my pleasure to be uh, hosting another round here at the conference, uh, this time with uh, Aaron Wartanen, uh, who's going to talk to us about uh, national security and the challenges of deep fakes, a very hot topic that I know a lot of people here are uh, interested in. And uh, I have been uh, assured that uh, this is the real Aaron we're, uh, we're gonna see today, but uh, um, we'll have to maybe authenticate that later. Uh, but uh, for those who don't know Aaron, uh, she's been here at the conference before, uh, and uh, she is a, a friend of uh, both mine and General Dunlap. We've both worked with her uh, over the years and she's fantastic. Erin uh, is the chief counsel for the Center for Cyber Intelligence uh, for the uh, CIA, an organization you might have heard of. Uh, and she leads a, a team focused on cyber law, cyber legislation and policy and advanced cyber threat response. Uh, so a big job. Uh, before joining the CIA, Erin uh, was uh, active duty JAG with uh, the Air Force. So she's uh, actually known General Dunlap for, I believe, more than 20 years. Um, and uh, she was the chief of operations law and chief of uh, military justice, among other positions. And Erin uh, has served uh, multiple, de multiple uh, deployments overseas and uh, served as the deputy uh, staff judge advocate and uh, staff judge advocate. So uh, she brings a wealth of experience to uh, to this conference, and uh, we're really excited about this topic. So, Erin, uh, I, I think that uh, the way we're going to do this is uh, I'm going to allow you to take over, and Erin uh, will make a brief presentation. We've got about 40 minutes, and then I will jump ba uh, back in, and we'll have some Q&A. So I encourage everyone to use the tool for your questions along the way. Okay, Erin? Great, I'm here and you can probably hear me, but you can't see me. I think we're having a little bit of technical difficulties getting my camera working. Um, we will roll with it anyway. Um, so yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, Shane, as anybody has who has been to the Duke conference before has um, seen that normally uh, I get introduced by General Dunlap and General Dunlap tends to enjoy um, embarrassing me just a little bit, which I appreciate. Um, but this opportunity I have now is to um, razz him a little bit as well. So we all know General Dunlap is a very well buttoned up, um, very professional, intellectual, military posture and respectable man. Um, However, one thing you may be surprised about General Dunlap is that he met his beautiful wife, Joy, at that Montgomery Little Theater. So I was able to miraculously um, dig up this video of our esteemed General Dunlap from a long time ago when he was courting his wife. And I just wanna share it with you all because I find it so sweet. So can we please roll video one? Only you can do make all this world seem right. So I bet you didn't know that General Dunlap had such a beautiful singing voice, um, but he did. Now, you know from the title of this talk that we are talking about deep fakes. So obviously that is a deep fake video. And I admit it, it is not a great one. Uh, by using a free application, I was able to upload a picture of General Dunlap that I found on the open internet. And I was able to um, download some software and make him sing all in less than 30 seconds. 30 seconds is nothing for somebody like me um, to create a video like this. I am not a technologist uh, in any way, shape or form. But if I am able to create this as an unsophisticated user using free software, what do you think a computer scientist could do in an hour using sophisticated software? A lot more, I can tell you that. 
So um, deep fakes have the ability to create fake news and malicious hoaxes. They can manipulate relationships and pose a serious threat to prosperity. Um, the increase in accessibility has led to a boon in prevalence across sectors like social media, cinema, politics, and pornography, unfortunately. Deep fakes are false, yet highly realistic, artificial intelligence created media and their videos, like such as people saying things they never would ordinarily or doing things that they never really did. Just like I made General Dunlap sing when he's never sung that song. Uh, well, not that I know of, but I suspect Joy might ask for an encore later. Uh, so the term deep fake really refers to digital manipulation of audio, images or video to make it appear the person did or said something they didn't do in a realistic way. The best deep fakes are undetectable and therefore hard to debunk. So how does the technology work? I'm gonna go a little into the tech, but don't worry, I won't go for long because I am an economics major. But in general, facial manipulation conducted with deep fakes can be categorized in the following categories. Face synthesis, face swap, facial attri attributes and expression. So the first one is face synthesis. In this category, the objective is to create non-existent realistic fakes faces um, using GANs. So GAN stands for Generative Adversarial Network, G-A-N, and it adds a frightening level of sophistication by using machine learning techniques that are incredibly hard to detect. So they were introduced, GANs were introduced in 2014, and um, they produce you know, using two separate neural networks or a set of algorithms designed to recognize patterns that work together by training themselves to learn the characteristics of real images so they can produce really convincing fake ones. The algorithm developed can then train itself on photos of a real person to generate fake photos of that real person and turn those photos into video. So ultimately, how it works is real images go into a generator which creates uh, goes to a, a discriminator, a discriminator um, tests the fake, and the results return to the generator. Another system is an artificial intelligence algorithm known as an encoder. Encoders are used in face swapping or face replacement technology. First, you run thousands of face shots of two people through the encoder to find similarities between the two images. Then a second AI algorithm or decoder retrieves the facial images um, and swaps them. A person's real face can be superimposed on another person's body, pretty scary. So the second category is face um, swap, which is the most popular facial manipulation category. The aim here is to detect whether an image or video of a person is fake after swapping its face. So the fake videos in this category are made using computer graphics and deep learning methods. The face swap app, is written in Python and uses face alignment, Gauss-Newton optimization and image blending to swap the face of a person seen by the camera with the face of a person in a provided image. The deep fake face swap approach is based on two autoencoders with a shared encoder that are trained to reconstruct training images of the source and target face respectively. Okay, I'm gonna stop there with the technology because like I said, economics major, I'm a lawyer, but I know when I'm getting out of my depth on the tech, and so I will leave the additional technology questions to the tech experts. The third um, basic kind is facial attribu attributes and expression. You guys have probably seen this yourselves. Uh, facial attributes and expression manipulation consists of modifying attributes of the face, such as the color of your hair or skin or age or gender, and the expression of the face by making it happy, sad, angry, most of these approaches adopt GANs for image to image translation. These are the apps that allow you to put a picture of yourself in and see how you would really look really old or really young. Have you seen those? Or where you can put um, your photo into an app to see how you'd look with a different hairstyle, different hair color. Those are all apps that use this type of technology. So, what I've told you so far is a little bit scary, but let's talk about how you actually are able to spot a deep fake. Poorly made deep fake videos may be easy to identify, but the higher quality ones can be tough. The one I just made of General Dunlap um, was, like I said, 30 seconds to make, although that's a little bit of a lie. It took me about an hour to 
pick which song I wanted him to sing, but uh, actually making it took 30 seconds. However, continuous advances in the technology make this detection more difficult. So what I'm going to do right now is give you a list of things that I, I want you to look for in the next video I'm gonna show you. Um, your goal is to look at the next video and determine for yourself if you think it's a deep fake or not. So look for these things I'm gonna tell you right now. So first, look for a natural eye movement or lack of blinking. Um, unnatural facial expressions, facial morphing, or unnatural body shape or hair, abnormal skin colors, awkward head position or body position, um, inconsistent head positions, odd lighting or discoloration, bad lip syncing, which was for General Dunlap's video, um, robotic sounding voices, if there's like some sort of digital background noise, or blurry or misaligned visuals. So right here, I'm gonna show you this video. And by the way, it's in French. It doesn't matter what he's actually saying. It's for the point of looking for those, those things I asked for. So can we please show video two? Aussi, j'ai demandé au Premier ministre de former un nouveau gouvernement plus restreint, constitué de femmes et d'hommes, prêts à donner la priorité à l'intérêt général et capable de faire preuve d'exemplarité, de probité, d'éthique. Il est capital pour notre nation d'en finir, une fois pour toutes, avec la corruption qui gangrène nos institutions. Il est capital d'en finir avec la mauvaise gestion, la mauvaise gouvernance, qui nous empêche d'avancer et nous interdisent de récolter les fruits des efforts colossaux et multiformes que l'État a Okay, Okay, so what do you think? If I was in front of a classroom, which I wish I were, I could have you raise your hands. Do you think it's a deep fake? So a few universities in the US have done forensic evaluations of this video, and they agree that more likely than not, that this was not a deep fake. Although there's not 100% certainty on that point. The um, Gabon example shows us exactly why we should care. Um, what happened was this was at Gabon's president, Ali Bongo, and he had been out of the public eye for some time. He kind of disappeared from the public in October of 2018 when he was um, out of the country. And people started wondering what had happened to him. So for a while, they were um, looking for him in a whole variety of um, places and rumors started to spread that he was sick, that he had had um, plastic surgery, that he had a stroke and what happened as a result of this video, the video was meant to show the people of Gabon that he was alive and well and everything was fine. But because so many people believed it to be a deep fake, it is said that that video you just saw led to actually an attempted military coup that happened on January 7th of 2019. So this is a huge reason we should care because even though this video was determined to not be a deep fake, um, the fact that the technology exists, the mere fact that technology exists led for people to question its authenticity. So let's talk about that a little bit more in the terms of our national security issues. So why do we care if we can easily make someone appear to do something they didn't actually do? Because the uses of deep fakes are endless. Originally, they are developed for use in pornography. Images of famous people, mostly actresses, were superimposed on the bodies of pornographic actors. Even today, 96% of deep fakes online are pornographic. And for some very unusual reason, a large percentage of them tend to be deep fakes of Nicolas Cage. I have no idea why. But porn, of course, is a short sighted use. And now deep fakes have gotten so good, they can be used or misused in many ways that could impact national security. So I'm going to have you see a video of what I'm going to call in slang, text slang. Uh, cheapskate. So let's show video three, please. Guys, I 
Here's the real video of Speaker Pelosi. And then he had a, a press conference in the Rose Garden with all this um, short sort of visuals that obviously were planned long before. And here's what Politics Watchdog posted on Facebook on Wednesday. And then he had a, a press conference in the Rose Garden with all this um, short sort of visuals that obviously were planned long before. Okay, so what does that show us? It shows us that um, this video first is in May of 2020. This video was obviously of um, Democratic politician Nancy Pelosi, and it was slowed down to 75% while her voice pitch was altered. It made her appear drunk and inhibited during a conference. It was then spread virally on social media and Pelosi re received significant backlash and criticism. Um, again, this is called a cheap fake since it is a real video, just altered technologically. I'm going to show you the next video in a second, but I want to give you a quick warning. The next video um, does not have cursing or swear words, but it does have a little bit of language that may make some uncomfortable. So if you feel like you might be uncomfortable, please just mute, mute, mute your TV or your uh, computer during this video. Um, and we'll avoid having that problem. So let's show video four, please. Dear people of Belgium, this is a huge deal. As you know, I had the balls to withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement, and so should you because what you guys are doing right now in Belgium is actually worse. You agreed, but you're not taking any measures. Only blah, 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 bing, bang, boom. You even pollute more than before the agreement. Shame. Okay, so that kind of looks and sounds like um, United States former President Donald Trump taunting the Belgian citizens about climate change in May of 2018. And it provoked hundreds of comments in the first few days from angry Belgians directing their fury at, at Trump and the American people. But that video was fake, created by a, a Belgian Democratic Social Party, political party, that used the video to redirect people to a political petition calling on the Belgian government to take, uh, Belgian parliament, sorry, to take more urgent climate action. Instead of revealing the hoax, the party just promoted their petition and very quickly, within a short period of time, it gained 20,000 views and helped the party gain signatures on the petition. When questioned about it later, they said they made it, uh, it purposefully appear fake because they did not want people to think it was the real video of Donald Trump. However, that is not what happened and people did think it was real for a period of time. Um, that video is actually of um, Donald Trump taken from a press conference that he gave. It, it's obviously been doctored, but uh, he gave to talk about the situation in Syria. So a completely different situation for which um, he was speaking legitimately. One more video I'm gonna show you, um, and this is in the political arena, the preeminent de deep fake video that we have um, that really gr gained attention by the US media and US audiences about the technology that does exist is a 2018 video of former US President Barack Obama. And this is him actually talking about deep fakes. However, this isn't really Obama, but it looked and sounded like him while being controlled by a famous comedian. So let's please show video five. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about... Now... You see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. 
Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the Internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. It may sound basic, but how we move forward in the age of information is going to be the difference between whether we survive. Okay, that's the last of the videos I'm going to show you. Um, I enjoy that one. There was an intentional um, mute in the middle of it um, because he did say something that I thought was inappropriate. Uh, but it is a very interesting video to see, especially the side by side comparison. So ultimately, what can happen? Deep fakes can bolster fake news. They can be a major security concern, especially in election years. And they have the potential potential to undermine political systems. So I'm going to have you consider some of these potential possibilities deep fakes could be used in that even General Mattis briefly discussed, he touched upon in his earlier talk. So fake videos could feature public officials taking bribes, uttering racial epithets, or engaging in adultery. Politicians and other government officials could appear in locations that they weren't doing or saying horrific things that they did not. Fake videos could place them in meetings with spies or criminals launching public outrage or criminal investigations or both. A deep fake might falsely depict a police officer shooting an unarmed black man while shouting racial epithets. A fake video clip may reveal criminal behavior by a candidate on the eve of election. A fake video may portray an Israeli officer doing or saying something so inflammatory as to cause riots in neighboring countries. False audio may depict U.S. officials privately admitting to a plan to commit this or that atrocious act overseas um, in order to disrupt an important diplomatic effort. A fake video could show emergency officials announcing a impending missile strike in Los Angeles or Washington, D.C., or an emergent pandemic in New York. Not that we've heard that one before, but could provoke panic and worse. Um, soldiers could be shown murdering innocent people in a war zone, and that could precipitate uh, waves of violence and even strategic harm to a war effort. In a LOAC context, they can be used to show a commander communicating false troop movements or movements of supplies. This could be seen as a lawful ruse, but alternatively, a deep fake of a commander falsely announcing the enemy had been defeated in order to lo lower the guard of the command could be tantamount to perfidy, which is a violation of low black. Further, if a deep fake was used to falsely announce defeat of one side, which causes the civilians to have a sense of safety and go out in the street, putting themselves in harm's way, this could also be a low act violation of care of civilians. So what do we do about all this? It, are, what can we do to prevent deep fakes from having these negative political, military, economic repercussions? There's a few things that um, we can do. The first let's talk about is social media rules. So social media platforms like Twitter have policies that outlaw deep fake fakes. Twitter um, requires deep fakes to be tagged. YouTube banned deep fake videos re related to the US Census and elections. Removal and tagging of deep fake videos is one way to handle it. Another is to have a some sort of platform that has uh, videos of important world leaders, politicians, government officials, um, and that site is independently verified. So we know that when you go to, you know, blank, blank, blank .com or .gov, that every video on there has been verified to be true. Second, research labs um, have been working really hard to use watermarks and blockchain technologies in an effort to detect deep fake te technology. Um, but the problem is the technology designed to create deep fake detectors is constantly evolving and the deep fake technology itself is evolving. Filtering programs are another option, which um, there's programs like Deep Trace and others that can provide some protection. It's a combination of antivirus and spam filters that monitor incoming media and quarantine suspicious content, kind of like your spam folders. Fourth, um, and I think this one's fascinating, is alibi software. Uh, so the idea is this, if you're a senior political official or some, someone 
famous person, someone who you might be more likely to be a victim of deep fake technology, you could hire a company that comprehensively tracks you, tracks your movements, tracks your electronic communications, in-person communications, and vi visual circumstances in order to provide an alibi if a deep fake is released to show you weren't there at the time or place of which the deep fake is, is situated. So I think that's interesting as a CIA lawyer because you'd be hiring someone to essentially surveil you 24 seven, not ideal in terms of solutions. So the other thing is uh, legislation. So we do have a little bit of legislation to talk about really quickly. Um, the NDAA of 2020, President Trump signed into law. The NDAA, of course, is the National Defense Authorization Act, and it's a $738 billion defense policy bill. And it basically requires three things, reporting on deep fakes. So it, it requires the Director of National Intelligence to submit to congressional intelligence committees um, to uh, the sort of national security implications or impacts of deep fakes and potential use of them by foreign governments. Second, it requires um, notification of any deep fake information that targets US elections. And third, it creates a competition um, to encourage the creation of deep fake, fake detection technologies. And that actually allows an award of up to $5 million to one or more winners. Another act quickly I'll talk about is identifying outputs of Generative Adversarial Networks Act, the IOGAN Act. And this one was made law in December of 2020. And it's basically a research act. It directs the Director of National Science Foundation and the Director of the National Institute of Standards and Technology to conduct research, outreach, um, and so on to um, find solutions to the de deep fake problem in terms of detection and verification. Some of the states have passed deep fake laws, Virginia for pornography, Texas for elections, and California for pornography and elections. And then of course, we always have our traditional law. Our traditional law is our traditional criminal law, things like extortion or harassment laws. If someone's using a deep fake video to try and get someone to pay them to destroy it or suppress it, um, that clearly would fall under our normal um, extortion laws. And then if it's being used to harass somebody, a harassment law may apply. On the tort side, then I think the best fit here is probably the false light invasion of privacy. Um, so basically um, that's when false light commonly addresses photo manipulation, embellishment and distortion. Uh, there also could possibly be a defamation claim. Um, and there's possibly an intentional infliction of emotional distress. Lastly, um, copyright is an issue um, that could be, could be uh, affected by a deep fake. And also um, the, it could raise the right of publicity claims and that kind of thing. So the legal solutions are not um, significant in terms of the quantity of legal recourse. There definitely are some um, avenues for recourse in this area, but there's certainly um, a lot more that could and may be done. So with that, I think I will stop for a minute and allow for some questions. Great. Thank you, Aaron. And uh, I'm glad your video is back up. Uh, although I, I think once we saw the video of General Dunlap, we really didn't need another video. Um, I assume that was uh, out of uh, revenge when he had the entire conference sing uh, happy birthday to you. <laughs> 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 uh, yes, actually, Shane, I, I was about to make a video of him singing happy birthday since this year the conference doesn't fall my birthday. And I, I was almost going to use that one instead. But, you know. <laughs> So um, this is a fantastic presentation and uh, I wish we had more time, but maybe we can get to uh, a couple of questions that I have and have uh, come in. Uh, and um, I'll just tell you at the outset that uh, the, one, of the, um, one of the things I notice about some of these conversations about deep fakes is, uh, particularly if you haven't really um, heard about the technology before, don't know much, much about it, is uh, a lot of them end up in the same places wow that scares the hell out of me um in fact we had a you know a panelist yesterday who i think said those exact same words 
Um, and uh, so I want to sort of get beyond the sort of uh, uh, fear factor of it and talk about, you know, some of these solutions. But I, I think it is helpful for us to uh, sort of categorize the problem because it, it seems to me there are different kinds of harms happening. Uh, you know, there's, uh, there are national security threats, as you described. There's, those are there are separate types of individual uh, uh, types of harm, uh, particularly with regard to women when it comes to pornography. As you said, like 90% of deep fakes are, are in that field. Um, but since you're coming from the intelligence community, and I know you're only speaking on your personal behalf, but I was wondering if you can just unpack a little bit more about uh, how you think uh, deep fakes might be shaping the way the IC goes about its business. So I, I think deep fakes have certainly um, affected the intelligence community's um, desire for verification. So when intelligence comes in, if it's in the form of a video or image that could have been manipulated, it allows and sort of requires the intelligence community to do a little additional verification to ensure the authenticity of the source and the authenticity of the image or video. Um, so that's a big way I think it, it Im implicates our, our our activity. It's not a widespread problem or as widespread as um, as it can be and as I think it will be ultimately, but I think we need to get in front of the problem before it sort of manifests into some real harm. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit more about the, the types of harm. Um, I'm trying to think about some of the solutions that you uh, described. Uh, the um, you you summarize some of the efforts that are being made, for example, on the social media platform front uh, in trying to adopt terms of service that address deep fakes. Um, uh, there are authentication efforts uh, to try to put digital fingerprints on these things. Um, and uh, and there, you know, there, there seems to be a lot of resources being pulled uh, uh, poured into the sort of uh, technological side of things. And I was just wondering um, if you thought what your thoughts are on sort of whether we have the right mix going on right now and trying to address these things. Should we be spending more emphasis? Like uh, I think Finland spends a lot of uh, of resources on education, you know, even at the grade school level. Um, and that this goes for you know disinformation and misinformation more generally. Um, I was just curious as you're you're sort of going through these uh, these proposals. Um, do you think we are, are spending our resources in the right way? And I know this is just, you know, your personal view on this. Yeah, I think the best solution is going to be a technological one in terms of detection and or um, creating platforms that are verified platforms that um, require different levels of verification of authenticity when they post videos. Um, so I think that's number one. But in terms of the educational piece, um, and you're right, some of the European nations um, have made this more of an important topic, but the best education piece so far for the American public has been um, has been the media and not just the media, but uh, comedians. Uh, they've had deep fakes on late shows um, they've had a variety of um, award shows where they presented deep fakes. So this is things that American public watches and to see the technology in action, I think will allow people to maybe be a little more critical of what they see. However, you know, we are in an era where um, news has been questioned on multiple levels at multiple by multiple parties. And so it does it does lend to that kind of concern. Educational efforts can certainly be ramped up and should be. And I think they will ultimately when um, this technology gains more traction. Yeah, that's a tricky uh, space. Um, uh, Daniel Citron and, and Bobby Chesney had a great article. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people uh, in the conference have read it. If you haven't, I recommend it a couple of years ago on, on deep fakes. And uh, they talk about what they call the, the liar's dividend, right? Where it, it, there's, a, there's an irony here because the, um, the or a paradox here, because once the public, you know, sort of becomes more informed about um, manipulation, then it's easier for public figures you know, to sort of deny, you know, real conduct and so, and so forth. So um, your head starts spinning. Um, so um, I also want to talk about um, just more specifically um, your view on social media platforms in general. So these efforts to uh, kind of carve out terms of service that, um, that, that either 
um, allow the companies to identify and tag uh, certain videos or to take them off the platforms. All of this is, you know, occurring, you know, uh, uh, it, it, there's no sort of government direction on this. This is all in the hands of private companies that are writing up the rules of the road. Um, and I think we've seen sort of mixed results. Some, you know, companies have been more aggressive than others, and some have been uh, more um, successful than others in identifying them. Uh, but there's, a, you know, obviously a problem with that approach, right? One is you talked about cheap fakes. It doesn't take much to get a video out there. So by the time that a social media platforms goes, you know, through the process of identifying uh, something as a fake, uh, determining that it uh, has violated the terms of service and taking it down. I mean, millions of people may have, have already seen it. Um, uh, and then there's the separate problem of the companies might not necessarily have the same understanding of what the harm is as other you know, entities that have a, a skin in the game. So for national security you know, uh, concerns, there are different equities at play for the government than there are for social media companies. Just curious on what you think, uh, uh, you know, of that approach of the the, the sort of uh, increasing reliance on these companies as gatekeepers. So, I, as we all know, social media companies have a lot of power. Um, however, I think one of the problems we've seen—not problems—that's the wrong word for it, but. Uh, some social media companies have taken these videos down and some have just tagged them. Some of the legal construct we have um, at play is the Constitution's First Amendment, freedom of speech, um, artistic expression. Some of these videos are done in a um, artistic way for that kind of purpose and that kind of outcome, not to actually create something to this malicious or to fool someone to believe something that's not true, but as, as a method of expression. And so I think with the constitution at play, um, the, the social media companies that have refused to actually take them down, but will tag them instead, have, have had that as their primary kind of rationale for doing so. Um, I don't think we should rely solely on social media companies. I think ultimately there needs to be some sort of ability um, widely either funded, government funded or, um, or government organized to allow for the detection of deep fakes specifically when it comes to US well, you know, political people, um, people who are well known and ca can exert some influence on the political, military, you know, governmental spectrum. That's a good, um, a good point. Uh, you can imagine, this goes back to sort of my original uh, thought of, if you think about this problem, you sort of have to think about different lanes, right? There are different equities at stake when you're thinking about domestic actors who may have First Amendment rights at stake than there might be about foreign actors. Uh, then, and the pornography problem is a different kind of problem than the national security problem. But you can also think about it in terms of the sources, the, the actors themselves. I don't know if people, um, no, a lot of people may know this, but uh, the House, House Ethics Committee took action uh, last uh, year, I think early last year, in advising members that they might be in violation of ethics rules if they engaged in the dissemination of, of fake videos. So that's an interesting, um, interesting way to think about it. So we're um, we're coming up on, uh, unfortunately, uh, on the uh, on our time, and uh, but I did want to save some time to to talk to you and ask you uh, the same question that has been uh, coming up in a number of different uh, uh, sessions, uh, because you are uh, a female, a woman who has uh, had great success in the intelligence community. And uh, we uh, have been talking a lot today about sort of, um, you know, what measures can be taken to uh, increase opportunities for leadership roles for women uh, in national security. So, uh, and I know you've been watching some of these sessions, so I just wanted to give you an opportunity to comment on that and, and, and ask you the same question that has been asked for others, which is for the young people around here, how do we become Aaron? <laughs> <laughs> you don't wanna become Aaron, but um, I, I do confess, I have, I think one of the coolest jobs in government um, in the cyber law arena, it's fascinating. It's interesting, it keeps me on my feet. Um, I, I think that there have, you know, just as the other speakers who have been asked the same question, there have been some 
previous barriers for females in certain areas of governmental um, governmental positions, um, especially senior positions. But I find that's really it's really changing. And the CIA, as Michelle Flournoy said, which I found was great, she talked about how she participated on this women's women in leadership um, survey that was done at CIA. And I actually was a lead counsel on that um, on that survey. So they have CIA has taken the issues of um, discrimination and women in leadership um, on a whole different front, very um, to the forefront. They've they've uh, had a lot of efforts to ensure that we are enabling all people with all different diverse backgrounds to be very successful. I would say for me personally, I um, have had a bit of um, luck um, being an Air Force JAG, uh, going overseas then and living in Africa and um, working for the State Department was fantastic. And then coming to the CIA, um, I've had on my end fantastic mentors, um, of which General Dunlap is one um, that has really helped me. And I would say that it's our responsibility as senior women now to do the same, pass it forward um, and take on younger folks to help mentor them. So if I were talking to your law students, and I know we're out of time, but if I'm talking to your law students, I'd say the number one thing you need to do is reach out to a senior woman in a career field of your interest and ask her if she could help mentor you or have coffee with you once a month or something easy like that. A lot of senior women would be flattered to do that. I know I, I've been asked the same thing and I've done it every time. I've never said no. So reach out to those females that you want to emulate future, in your future career. And that's it. Fantastic. That's a great note to uh, go out on uh, because you not only scared the hell out of us, but you also gave us um, some really uh, great and positive advice. Um, and I hope that the young people um, who are listening in will, will take it. So thank you, Aaron. Um, we appreciate it. Uh, this was fantastic. And uh, uh, we will see uh, everyone at the top of the hour. Thank you.